Join me, Ed Bloxham, in a journey through the music of Sergei Lyapunov, presented prosaically and obsessively, Epis 1 to Epis 71. Here's my supplementary Lyapunov Piano Concerto podcast. Uh, it will be on the Tube Review, but I can't be bothered to film it, partly because my camera is crap, partly because it's just going to be me looking at a screen. So that's not very interesting anyway. And then I can play around, I'm just a stickler for good audio, so then I can make this audio a little bit better, hopefully. This is largely reading of an academic article. Um, I don't especially want to interpolate my thoughts onto the writer's thoughts, so I just thought I'd preserve them. So you can listen to it, but you can also read it. There are links below to the entire article. It's a performer's guide, so there's quite a lot of stuff about how to play certain bits on the piano, which may or may not be interesting to you, but I'm not going to read them because that's not the point. What I'm trying to do is gain a convenient analysis of Lyapunov's first piano concerto. Uh, it is here in front of me. It is open source, so free to use. But, like I said, I want to credit Irina Kunev, who wrote it. So it is a, um, Irina Kunev who submitted it to the Lu Louisiana State University and Agricultural and Mechanical College. Sure, Agricultural and Mechanical College. And apparently they do Lyapunov. They study Lyapunov. I thought he was a human and not a cow. But there we go. Right, submitted Louisiana State University in 2015. Doctoral dissertation. Ooh. Right, let's read the abstract. This document is intended to contribute to the ongoing study of Sergei Lyapunov's work by focusing on his first piano concerto, a brilliant work that was once highly esteemed, but which has been unjustly neglected over the years. The main purposes of this study and the accompanying public lecture recital are threefold. One, to provide a historical background and to discuss major music trends that shaped Lyapunov's style, along with biographical information about the composer's life. Two, to provide a specific descriptive analysis of key stylistic elements utilised in the concerto. That's what I'm really after. And three, to provide a detailed discussion of pianistic techniques used by the composer. That's what we're skipping. These goals are aimed at providing a practical guide for the performer who wishes to achieve a thorough understanding of this complex work. Yes, this is, of course, this isn't the only thing you could read about the concerto. This is just something I found convenient. I, I flicked through it and found it quite good. Right, introduction. Sergei Lyapunov's Piano Concerto No. 1 in E-flat minor opus 4 is a landmark work that displays many tendencies present in Russian music at the close of the 19th century. Lyapunov belongs to a generation of composers who came of age during an era between the emergence of the mighty handful, Mili Balakirov, Cesar Kui, Modest Mazursky, Nikolai rimsky kosakov and Alexander Borodin, and Tchaikovsky, from a slightly earlier time, and the radical composers such as Skriabin, Stravinsky, Prokofiev, and Shostakovich, who would help shape Russian music in the 20th century. As a composer, he didn't demonstrate much interest in the new trends that developed during his lifetime. His style is more a reflection of various stylistic characteristics in Russian music of the late 19th century, as opposed to the innovative directions taken by the more progressive composers of the 20th century. Hmm. Lyapunov's first piano concerto possesses a wide range of expression and is an example of a complex work that is influenced by Russian folk materials, which is typical of the era. It also makes significant technical and interpretive demands on the pianist. Although the piece is an earlier work in Lyapunov's output, it demonstrates an established style that remained essentially unchanged throughout his lifetime, showing an early commitment to a specific artistic path. This document is intended to contribute to the ongoing study of Lyapunov's work by focusing on his first piano concerto, a brilliant work that was once highly esteemed, but which has been unjustly neglected over the years. Chapter 1. Musical trends in Russia during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The abolition of serfdom in 1861 brought revolutionary changes to the cultural life of Russia. The former dominance of Western European traditions in the arts gradually gave way to an increased interest in a national heritage, which resulted in a growing demand for its wide promotion and natural recognition and national recognition. Russian artists began to display a greater sense of national identity, along with an increased range of emotional expression. The turn of the 19th century was characterised by a particularly intense emotional tone in the arts. Lyricism manifested itself most completely in music, which is often regarded as the most lyrical of all the arts. The first piano factory appeared in Russia in 1810, but was accessible only to aristocratic families. By the middle of the century, however, the instrument's popularity and accessibility began to expand beyond the wealthy. Claimed European keyboard artists toured the country, sparking an interest that helped propel the rapid advancement of Russian pianism. Two dominant stylistic trends were key 
in shaping the emerging school of Russian pianism. One, the lyrical style associated with composers such as John Field, and more importantly, Frédéric Chopin, Another, the virtuoso tradition of piano performance and composition associated with both Chopin and Franz Liszt. Irish composer John Field settled in St. Petersburg in 1803, where he enjoyed an active performing and teaching career. The influence of Field's teaching methods and productive compositional career on generations of Russian composers cannot be overestimated. Among those who came under his influence were Alexander Grilev, Laskovsky, Alexander Dubake, who was later Balakirov's teacher, and whom the young Russian musician credited with whatever technical skills he developed, and his famous pupil, Mikhail Glinka, who is regarded as the founder of Russian classical music. The lyricism of Field's melodies, the distinctive, widely spaced, arpeggiated contour of the left-hand accompaniments of his nocturnes, his virtuosic pianism, and certain structural innovations found in his seven piano concertos, inspired many of the leading composers of the first half of the 19th century, both in Western Europe and Russia. The Fugato section in the finale of Field's second piano concerto might have influenced Balakirov to incorporate a similar developmental device in his concerto in E-flat. Tchaikovsky's Concert Fantasia, Op. 56, has a similar two-movement design to Field's third concerto. Also, Field's fifth and seventh concertos greatly impacted Villong's. Piano Concerto Opus 4, which in turn influenced the generations of Russian composers embarking on the task of writing in the piano concerto genre. Beginning in 1842, the Listomania that swept across Europe had a major influence on the formation of a distinctly Russian piano school. Liszt's Russian concert tours in 1842-43 had a galvanizing effect on Russian audiences and musicians. His innovative compositional language and his virtuosic performance ability demonstrating unprecedented technical skill and a manner of treating the instrument that Russian audiences had never heard were thrilling. Liszt's novel teaching methods also won quick recognition across Europe and Russia. Students schooled in his approach were in high demand in Russia, such was the level of fascination with his style. As a result of these developments, two divergent streams, one nationalist and the other influenced by Western Europe, began to affect Russian cultural life. Not only did these rival camps shape Russian music, they left an indelible imprint on music internationally. Indeed, the creations of composers such as Balakirov, Mazolsky, Borodin, Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff gained worldwide popularity, establishing Russia as a cultural leader. The nationalistic path in music pioneered by Mikhail Glinka was in large part a reaction to the overwhelming dominance of Western European culture in Russia during the early 19th century, resulting in a desire to create a distinctly Russian school of composition. This impulse is associated, most prominently, in the music of a group of amateur musicians who have been labelled the so-called Ugukaya Guka, or Mighty Handful, apologies for pronunciation, who were active in St. Petersburg between 1856 to 1870. The Mighty Handful was led by Mili Bayakirev, and also included Cezar Kui, Modest Mazorgsky, Nikolai rimsky korsakov and Alexander Borodin. The aesthetic advisor of this group was the well-known music critic Vladimir Stasov. Despite their relative lack of formal training, all the members were exceptionally gifted composers who, inspired by Mikhail Glinka's earlier efforts, shared similar ideas and passions about forming a distinctly Russian national style in music. In contrast to his predecessors who used folk melodies as themes that were in turn grafted onto existing Western forms, Glinka developed a new direction in Russian compositional style which Robert Riedenor described in his book. Glinka, however, attempted to create an original musical language from authentic folk music, or more often invented themes that mimicked the melodic, harmonic and rhythmic idiosyncrasies of Russian popular song. In doing so, he pushed beyond the conventional boundaries of harmony and form that the most advanced Western composers of his day were just beginning to expand and created a personal style marked by daring harmonies dynamic and flexible rhythms, and bright, pure orchestral colours. This was the innovative style Balakirov accepted as the hallmark of authentic Russian national music. Also, it is important to mention that for Balakirov and his group, the Russian national style was not limited to Russian composers and Russian folk material. Just as Glinka's music demonstrates the composer's fascination with the folk heritage of other nations, Balakirov's circle also expressed deep interest in Serbian, Spanish, Jewish, Ukrainian, Armenian, Persian, Far East, Oriental, and other folk traditions. 
the mighty handful favoured programmatic music as well, as was common with most radical musical romantics, such as Robert Schumann, Berlioz and Liszt, and indeed Klaus Schumann too. In contrast to the new Russian school represented by the mighty handful, an artistic trend that reflected a more Germanic approach, while also emphasising the performance traditions of Liszt and Chopin, was emerging. Led by the great pianist and composer, Anton Rubinstein, who met both Liszt and Chopin during his own tour of Paris in 1841, this particular trend was highlighted by what Rubinstein felt was the necessity of establishing a more professional level of musical training in Russia. Through the support and involvement of Grand Duchess Elena Pavlovna, Rubinstein helped found the Russian Musical Society, which opened multiple branches throughout the country, dedicated to providing musical training to the nation's most gifted students. In 1862, the branch in St. Petersburg was formally recognised as the first Russian conservatory, with many prominent Western European musicians appointed as professors. Four years later, Anton's brother, Nikolai Rubinstein, stood at the opening of a second Russian conservatory in Moscow, where among its first appointed professors was Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, a recent graduate from the St. Petersburg Conservatory. The establishment of conservatories provided a solid foundation for the training of future generations of Russian composers and performers. As Boris Asafeyev noted, it marked a progression of Russian musical life from dilettante to professional. The differences in musical philosophy between the Rubinstein camp and the mighty handful resulted in the founding of the Free Music School as a rival to the Rubinstein's conservatory, regardless of the intense disagreements between the two camps and the highly charged emotions that built up. The efforts of both were valuable in moving Russian musical culture forward. Indeed, the generations of gifted Russian composers and performers who emerged in the late 19th century were the direct result of the work done by these two schools. In Lyapunov's life and work, one can trace a mixture of influences, but with a decided final shift toward Balakirev's camp. Lyapunov's interest in the compositions of the new Russian school and his friendship with Balakirev had a decisive influence on his artistic development. His artistic maturity coincided with times of political turbulence in Russia. Two revolutions, a civil war, and World War I, all had major influence on the arts in his country. Moreover, these political and social events further aggravated the artistic controversy between followers of the 19th century Russian classic style, both of Rubinstein's and that of the nationalist composers, and the emerging new trends of modern radical composers like Skriabin, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, and others. Lyapunov preserved the ties with the classic direction and created a number of notable compositions following the lead of Glinka and the mighty handful composers. Biographical information. Born on November the 18th, 1859, in the Russian city of Yaroslavl, Lyapunov showed his musical gifts at a very early age. His mother, who was also a gifted pianist, became Lyapunov's first piano teacher. After learning the basics of sight reading, his first substantial piece was Liszt's transcription of the overture to William Tell by Rossini, which his mother often played in her home. Needless to say, even a simplified arrangement made by his mother was too difficult for the child. Nonetheless, it was his first acquaintance with a composer whose compositional and pianistic style became a lifelong fascination of Lyapunov. After his father's death in 1870, Lyapunov and his family moved to Nizhny Novgorod, where in 1873 he attended the music classes in the newly opened branch of the Russian Musical Society. Upon the recommendation of Nikolai Rubinstein in 1878, Lyapunov was accepted to the Moscow Conservatory. He was first admitted into the piano class of V.I. Vilborg, and two years later transferred to the class Karl Klinvort, Vilborg's former teacher and himself a former pupil of Liszt. Lyapunov was introduced to Liszt's teaching method and covered an extensive repertoire of the most technically demanding works of the piano literature. When Klinvort left the conservatory and moved to Berlin, Lyapunov continued his studies with another former student of Liszt, P.A. Pabst. Of all these, Lyapunov valued Karl Klindvort the most. He later dedicated his monumental Sonata in F minor, Opus 26, composed between the years of 1906 and 1908, to his beloved and highly respected teacher. It comes as no surprise that this work had many similar traits with Liszt's Sonata in B minor, S 178, such as high levels of virtuosity, orchestral treatment of the piano, melodic transformation used for the purpose of creating structural unity, and of course its groundbreaking four movements in one form. 
Unfortunately, Lyapunov's composition studies at the Moscow Conservatory left him dissatisfied. Since his time at the gymnasia in Nizhny Novgorod, he dreamed of studies with Tchaikovsky, whom he considered an eminent master of Russian music. To Lyapunov's disappointment, Tchaikovsky was not as strong a teacher as he was a composer. Also, Lyapunov's personality and musical tastes didn't match those of S.I. Teneyev, his other professor of composition. It was during his years in the conservatory that Lyapunov showed an increased fascination with the works of composers who represented the new Russian school, specifically the members of the Mighty Handful, led by Balakirev. Borodin's Bogatia Symphony and Balakirev's Islamé left a particularly lasting impression on the young musician. This led to Lyapunov's increasing disappointment with the composition faculty of the Moscow Conservatory and its Western-oriented approach. He was increasingly drawn to the opposing philosophies of Balakirev's group, which became more influential on his own musical style. In 1883, after graduating from the Conservatory, Lyapunov met Balakirev in person, an encounter that started a lifelong friendship and collaboration between the two composers. Balakirev persuaded Lyapunov to move to St. Petersburg. There, under Balakirev's guidance, Lyapunov started working on his first symphony in B minor. An important part of Balakirev's teaching method was to have his students compose a symphonic work, marking the beginning of Lyapunov's acquaintance with Balakirev's style, which strongly influenced his entire creative output. Moreover, through Balakirev, the composer became personally acquainted with the other members of the mighty handful. Lyapunov's talent as a brilliant virtuoso pianist was widely recognized by the acclaimed critics and artists of his time, as evidenced by numerous articles and concert reviews. It is therefore not surprising that Lyapunov's preferred medium of expression was the piano. Here he explored a variety of genres, ranging from small-scale works to large compositions, such as his two piano concertos and his rhapsody on Ukrainian themes for piano and orchestra. As is evident from the list of his works, Lyapunov favoured instrumental music. Notable exceptions are the songs for voice and piano that often use folk materials. Lyapunov was a well-known folklorist and a member of the Russian Geographical Society. With colleague F. M. Istomin, he was commissioned to travel to remote regions of Russia to collect and record folk songs. This exposition resulted in the publication of Songs of Russian People by the Society in 1899, and also in Lyapunov's publication of his two volumes of songs accompanied by piano. Although he established no new artistic trends, Lyapunov enjoyed the respect and acclaim of his contemporaries, both as a performer and a composer. His compositions were warmly received by the public, and received positive reviews from the critics of his time. His first public appearance as the conductor of his scherzo in F major for orchestra, performed at the Moscow Conservatory in 1883, was praised by S. Flerov in the local newspaper Moskovskiye Vedemosti, but it was in his piano music that his style manifested itself to the fullest. Some of his piano works are considered his best compositional achievements. One of his well-known compositions in the solo piano repertory that enjoys some popularity with pianists and attracts interests from musicologists is a set of the Twelve Transcendental Etudes, Opus 11, dedicated to the memory of Liszt. Both the extreme levels of virtuosity required of the performer, as well as certain details of compositional style, mimic Liszt's style to some degree. Nonetheless, the originality of the musical language in Lyapunov's Etudes is undeniable, demonstrating the composer's close ties with new Russian school principles and traditions. Significantly, his first piano concerto, Opus 4, which was completed in 1890 and dedicated to Balakirev, received a prestigious Glinka Prize in 1904 as one of the best new Russian compositions. Funded by Mitrofan Believ, additional Glinka prizes went to Rachmaninoff for his piano concerto No. 2, Skriabin for his third and fourth piano sonatas, Irensky for his piano trio in D minor, and Taneyev for his symphony in C minor. Lyapunov's concerto drew considerable interest from in the leading pianists of his time. In 1908, Lyapunov succeeded Balakirev as a director for the Free Music School in St. Petersburg. After the death of his mentor, Lyapunov completed some of Balakirev's unfinished works and orchestrated his mentor's most celebrated work, the Oriental Fantasy Islamé, in 1912. Between 1910 and 1923, the composer taught piano and composition at the Petersburg Conservatory. Due to the uneasy political situation in Russia following the revolution, his unwillingness to renounce his religious views in favour of the atheist regime of the Soviet Union forced him to emigrate to Paris in 1923. The circumstances surrounding his emigration 
are omitted in most of the sources written before the downfall of the Soviet Union due to the censorship of the regime. According to M. L. Lukachevskaya, Lyapunov's figure of the church warden of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Church at St. Petersburg Conservatory was deeply hostile to the ideologists of the Soviet Union. As a result of the tribunal on the church affairs during which Lyapunov remained faithful to his religious beliefs, the composer was deprived of the rights to teach and also the means of supporting his extended family. He left his fatherland on the pretext of a European concert tour. In Paris, he continued his musical career with a renewed strength, which unfortunately was ended in less than a year by a sudden heart attack which caused his death. Chapter 2 Lyapunov's First Piano Concerto, Opus 4. The place of Lyapunov's first piano concerto in the development of an emerging genre of Russian piano concerto. Lyapunov's monumental first piano concerto represents a significant contribution to the history of the piano concerto in Russia. Despite being seldom performed today, it enjoyed wide public acclaim and appreciation during Lyapunov's lifetime. In his book, Schiffman refers to the correspondence between M. Balakirov and A. A. Petrov, in which Balakirov discusses Lyapunov's concerto as well as his symphony as monumental compositions, promulgation of which will present an invaluable input into the music literature. For a better understanding of this work's value, it is useful to consider the development of the concerto genre in Russia at the time of its composition, with the exception of A. Villoing's Piano Concerto, recognized as the first such work in the genre by a Russian composer, Anton Rubinstein's five piano concertos, written between 1850 and 1874, are considered the first works of value, paving the way for future developments. Despite their heavy stylistic reliance on Beethoven, Liszt, and Mendelssohn, these compositions served as study material and models for his near contemporaries. Notably, Rubinstein's fourth concerto in D minor, Opus 70, was a major influence on Tchaikovsky's brilliant piano concerto No. 1. In addition, Balakirov's piano concerto in E flat was influenced by Rubinstein's second concerto, and particularly the use of fugal elements. It is interesting that Balakirov did not complete this work, which he started in 1861, leaving it to Lyapunov, who finished it in 1910, the year of Balakirov's death. Taneyev's attempt in the piano concerto genre was unsuccessful and was aborted after harsh criticism from his contemporaries. Arensky's piano concerto in F minor, Opus 2, from 1882, although leaning heavily on Chopin's concertos and lacking musical individuality, had a more favourable fate. It was included in the teaching repertoire at Russian conservatories and was performed by such well-known Russian pianists as Pabst, Goldenweitzer and Ginsberg. Rimsky-Korsakov's concerto, first performed in 1884, is often praised for its masterful treatment of folk material, successful balance between the soloist and the orchestra, and idiomatic writing for the instrument. Curiously, Rachmaninoff disagreed with this assessment, while finding Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto, which contains many awkward passages for the soloist, idiomatically written for the instrument. The works of these Russian composers gives us some idea of how the concerto genre had progressed up until the point when Lyapunov began his own first concerto. Lyapunov's first piano concerto was completed in 1890, predating the masterpieces of his near-contemporary Rachmaninoff and later compositions from the Soviet era by Prokofiev and others who solidified the Russian approach to the genre. Lyapunov's concerto features a sure grasp of orchestral composition combined with a deep knowledge of both the piano's sound capacities as well as virtuoso keyboard technique. In addition, the musical ideas of high aesthetic quality. While writing for the orchestra did not pose problems for experienced Russian composers of this era, the piano orchestra combination, with its particular aesthetic considerations and balance issues, was a challenge for most. Mimsky Korsakov being a notable exception with his piano concerto. In Lyapunov's concerto, the piano part, which is successfully integrated into the orchestral setting, is highly virtuosic, occasionally quite showy, but also idiomatic for the player. Wide stretches throughout the composition seem to indicate that it is intended for performers with large hands, but all the figurations and chords fit naturally under the fingers. Even a key choice, E flat minor tends to be a comfortable choice from a physical standpoint. Although the piece at times resorts to excessive use of sequences and condenser-like passages which are very characteristic among composers of this era, the musical ideas themselves are nonetheless inspired and lyrical. Another strength of the piece is the equal importance of soloist and orchestra in the presentation of thematic material. 
the orchestra is far from subordinate, as was the case in many of the works of Lyapunov's predecessors. In addition, despite the strong influence of Liszt, Lyapunov's musical ideas are distinctly his own. Unlike the derivative nature of the passage work and melodic content of Rubinstein's and Arensky's concerto, the issue of balance between soloist and orchestra, a weakness in many Russian concertos of the era, is not evident in Lyapunov's work. Lyapunov displays an excellent sense of timbral and registral specifics, and even when the orchestral tutti is at full volume, the piano part is not submerged. It cuts through because of the composer's expert knowledge of the proper technical setting for the pianist, aspect of the piece that will be discussed more fully in the next chapter. Descriptive Analysis of Lyapunov's First Piano Concerto Lyapunov spent more than three years working on his first piano concerto. The compositional process presented many challenges for the young composer. Especially difficult was the choice of formal structure for the piece. Initially conceived as a composition structured in a traditional multi-movement form, after two years of work and struggle with the projected middle section Andante, as suggested by Balakirev, Lyapunov decided to go with a one-movement sonata allegro form with cyclic elements following Liszt's new trends. Liszt's innovative double-function structures, in which elements of a multi-movement plan are folded into a single movement that resembles traditional sonata allegro form, proved best for Lyapunov in his first concerto. He also turned to it later on in his other large-scale works, such as the second piano concerto of E major, the violin concerto in D minor, and his monumental piano sonata in F minor, of which the composer was particularly proud and considered one of his best works. The unsuccessful Andante was replaced with a lyrical Adagio non tanto episode in the unrelated key of D major that serves as a secondary theme zone. It should be noted that the one-movement sonata allegro form of Lyapunov's first piano concerto is not divided into clear sections that could be perceived as internal movements, as is the case in Liszt's models. The orchestral interludes that are based solely on the opening theme of the concerto and which are inserted between each important section of the concerto, act as recurring refrains, causing the structure to resemble a large sonato rondo form. Lyapunov's desire for dramatic impact is further reinforced with the choice of mirror recapitulation, where the primary and secondary subjects are stated in reverse order, which, when looking at the entire piece, reveals an overall arch-like design. Introduction, exposition, primary theme, secondary theme, development, recapitulation, Secondary theme, primary theme, coda. The extended introductory section of the concerto is presented primarily by the orchestra. In contrast to Liszt's concertos, in which the piano enters at the beginning of the piece, the Apanov delays the soloist's entrance until roughly the midpoint of the introduction, where it takes over the presentation and development of opening material from the orchestra. Overall, the introduction has a somewhat unusual structure compared to the traditional orchestral exposition. It is clearly divided into three sections, each of them with distinctive thematic functions. The first section of the introduction presents the basic thematic material for the entire concerto. The opening phrase features two basic motifs. These motifs assume more independent roles as the piece progresses, reappearing separately or in interaction with each other in more polyphonic textures as well as undergoing extensive development in both orchestral interludes and connecting sections of the concerto. The noble, stately opening theme is presented in low register unison. Its character recalls the image of Bogatyr, a godly hero of Russian folklore that is a recurring theme in Russian music and arts of the time. Interestingly, it suggests a reference to the opening of Borodin's second symphony, the so-called Bogatyr Symphony, that Lyapunov admired, which also begins with a robust orchestral tutti unison statement. Similar to Borodin's symphony, Lyapunov's concerto opening theme statement is immediately juxtaposed with a contrasting material presented by the two lyrical motifs that form the basis of the primary and secondary themes of the concerto. The secondary section of the introduction in Lyapunov's concerto is concerned with the development of the two introductory motifs that are now combined in a polyphonic texture in the orchestra. The final eight measures of the orchestral introduction features an orchestral crescendo based on dominant harmonies preparing for the grand entrance of the soloist. The soloist's entrance is marked capriccioso and displays the obvious influence of Liszt in its virtuosic cadenza-like setting that exploits the entire range of the keyboard. Another notable Liszt-like feature is the use of rapidly alternating chord structures. 
The thematic material of this section is derived from the opening motifs of the introduction, which are developed further in this cadenza passage that is actually the culmination of the long introduction. It is harmonically unstable, undergoing numerous tonicizations. Several sequential passages culminate in a strong dominant preparation reinforced by an arrival on the B flat seven chord containing an augmented fifth, enhanced by a fermata, then followed by more cadenza material that finally resolves in the home key of E flat minor, effectively signalling the beginning of the primary theme area of the exposition. The primary theme that enters in measure ninety three features a simple, beautiful melody imbued with longing qualities that evoke the spirit of authentic Russian folk song. It unfolds over an arpeggiated left-hand accompaniment that owes much to the nocturne style of field. An orchestral interlude marked Pew Animato Tempo 1 follows, beginning in measure 186. Characterized by a sophisticated polyphonic texture, ah, Lyapunov displays his mastery of imitative and in particular canonic techniques. The solo piano episode Andantino, beginning in measure 230, with its clearly defined mood to change, provides an effective preparation the appearance of the secondary theme. The secondary theme, marked by a tempo change to Adagio non tanto, features a sophisticated lyrical melody. Its poetic sensibility suggests the influence of Russian folk music. The thematic material of this section is derived from the opening motifs of the introduction, which are developed further in this cadenza passage that is actually the combination of a long introduction. An extensive solo cadenza brings the exposition to a close. Though the opening theme as initially presented is an unmistakable unifying element, the most important dramatic facet of the piece is Lyapunov's use of thematic transformation in treating the primary theme. As it appears in the development section, the pensive character heard in its initial presentation by the piano gives way to the majestic character as executed by the orchestra in the lower registers, paired with virtuosic piano figurations that span a wide range of the keyboard. The theme is presented in a vertical chordal texture, thus intensifying the almost solemn grandeur of the section. In the recapitulation, the secondary theme is restated in its original character and is followed by an intense orchestral interlude marked Allegro, Allegro con Brio Tempo 1, where the orchestral texture features a rumbling tremolo effect on a dominant pedal, with other instruments playing material from the opening theme. The piano thickens the texture with its entrance in measure 642, characterized by virtuosic martellato figurations. All while, the dominant pedal continues and the tension builds, effectively preparing for the grand return of the primary theme for its final statement in measure 666. The theme is presented in a vertical choral disposition, just as it was in the development section, but now unfolds as a massive, triumphant tutti in the firm E-flat major key. This marks the emotional climax of the piece. By choosing a one-movement form characterized by the arch-like design created by the reversed order of theme presentation in the recapitulation, and through an economy of musical material development, Lyapunov shows an obvious desire for compositional unity in this work. To be sure, the composer does struggle at times in sustaining momentum in this and other large-scale works. The frequent alternation of seemingly isolated sections and the frequent piano cadenza passages can make the piece seem fragmented at times. Nonetheless, it is still a very effective piece. Perhaps this relative difficulty with large forms explains his shift to smaller scale works later in his career. Chapter 4 Conclusion Along with his other two compositions for piano and orchestra, the second piano concerto in E major, Op. 38, and the Rhapsody on Ukrainian Themes, Op. 28, Lyapunov's first piano concerto is characterized by its symphonic scale and the haunting lyricism of its themes, unmistakably evoking the Russian folk music spirit. This is in keeping with trends that new Russian school composers were establishing in this genre. Lyapunov's distinctive virtuosic style was greatly influenced by Liszt and Balakirev. In fact, Balakirev, the dedicatee of Lyapunov's first piano concerto, closely followed Lyapunov's work on the composition, giving a great deal of advice, also editing the finished work, and ensuring its debut in a free school of music concert in 1891. The enthusiastic work by a composer at the very dawn of his career filled with youthful energy and inspiration. It demonstrates certain techniques and tendencies that Lyapunov would revisit throughout his life, and which received further development in the works of later generations of composers. Among these tendencies is Lyapunov's inclination to search for new ways to unify formal structures by adapting older models 
much as Liszt did. Lyapunov's legacy remains somewhat in the shadows. Although not all of his works are of high quality, which can be said of most composers, his first concerto is a composition that deserves to be brought back to light. His legacy has recently attracted the interest of scholars not only in Russia, but also abroad, with common agreement among them that relative neglect of his music is undeserved. Right, I skipped over. Uh, <laughs> so the the end is a the end is a biography of of the study of his work, which is uh, levels of biography. I also skipped over some of the analysis because I didn't think it was communicating very well in this form. The uh, full article is I've posted a link. It's available for free. I post a link. You can read it if you wish. Now I'll talk about the things that are different. In particular, the use of the thematic material. The author's name is Irina Kunev. Irina Kunev identified uh, two themes. Um, I believe what I called a counter theme was what she called theme one, and, and what I agreed to this was the slow theme two, was theme two. She said the the first theme was a, like an introductory scene that came back at certain key moments, as if in a kind of rondo. But that doesn't really work because it comes back too often. It's clearly the theme is supposed to be a more important part of the piece. It's not just something you chuck in, not just a signpost. And also it alters significantly. So if it was just a signpost, it would it would appear roughly the same and then disappear very quickly. It doesn't. And this is reinforced by the fact that this first theme is um is the is the music, is the theme that ends the whole piece. So in its altered form, in a dramatically altered form. So I don't really agree that the that it's a sort of subsidiary theme. But you know, uh, that's fine. Um, like I said, one of the you can argue about which, what is a theme, what is not a theme, and that's why I think this music is interesting. It doesn't have clear lines where you can go, oh, this is clearly theme one, this is clearly theme two, this is clearly the recapitulation, this is clearly the development section. I mean, her definition of where the recapitulation started is different to mine. So yeah, I think it's up it's up for debate. Uh, even if I'm wrong, it's still up for debate. Uh, which is interesting within itself. Yeah, the mirror thing, the mirror structure thing was quite interesting. Like I said, I interpreted the beginning of the recapitulation as a slightly different point, uh, as indeed as part of the development itself. And also, um, the the first theme doesn't clearly come back. Let's look at my notes. So there is definitely the big section where the second theme is is clearly stated. And after that, no, it's just sort of, there's only the only thing that is stated clearly before the coda is the second theme so it's not really a mirror either i don't think yes so like i said i'm not trying to invalidate irina kunev's efforts she probably knows more than i do but particularly about how it relates to other russian music yes i wanted to check whether uh, ratmanov's first piano concerto was written after lyapunov's apparently it was uh, published in 1891, uh, Lyapunov's was 1890. Would Rachmaninoff have heard the Lyapunov concerto? Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe, I mean, it, it, um, 1890, he takes him a year to write the first piano concerto. Conceivably, he conceived of the entire piece based on Lyapunov's piano concerto. I don't know, we're getting into dangerously close to biographical detail there. Yawn. Revised 1917. Oh, well, that might be the piano concerto. So um, certainly, if if Rachmaninoff revised the piano concerto in 1917, that would be the version I've heard. So that would certainly be influenced by. Maybe it sounded. Maybe Rachmaninoff's first piano concerto sounded quite different. All right, 1901 was piano concerto number two by Rachmaninoff. Yes, I will say that he was definitively influenced by Lyapunov. I've listened to R Rubinstein. Like the author said, there's nothing special about it. It's rather functional and rudimentary it's it's as if he's ticking boxes rubenstein is not is very very conservative he's one of the conservative composers that are forgettable because everything has been everything he writes has been written before so and he's just repeating things completely by rote so that's what it sounds like it's just bleh. i certainly can't hear any rachmaninoff isms in rubenstein so yeah yes i think the lyapunov concerto is the crucial turning point. There we are. Thank you for listening. I've been Evan Bloxham. I'll continue to be Evan Bloxham. Please like and subscribe or don't.